What was was Viejas common when you were a kid? Did people talk about hey I'm Bear from, Lung? I'm from Viejas Fresh. What did they say no. when you were young? Bear Lung. What did they say? Bear Lung. They didn't say Viejas. We uh, that was Viejas the Mountain. Conejos, uh, where your great grandmother was born. Conejos uh, is one of the oldest surviving villages in all of San Diego County. Mm -hmm. It's just been there for a long, long time because it was remote, hard to get to. They didn't come over the hill this way. They had to go the other way through uh, El Monte and up San Diego River and then up Conejos Creek to get to Conejos. Mm -hmm. And there was a just like a one lane old trail where they had, you could pull wagons, which was challenging. So they just left us alone there. And I think a lot of those traditional values stayed with us, and that's who we are today. Uh, that's what I used to, I, I remember, and, and met my grandmother's too, because, uh, she used to uh, she used to make egg crow. she used to make uh, shawi but she made it from the, she used the hummus uh, you know the rock she'd use that to uh, grind it and she'd tell me to turn on the water and turn it off she'd make a lot of shawi too and I remember her chopping wood splitting wood which uh, Larry told me she said that when she lived in, in Captain Grandy during the Depression, and she said, we didn't even know it was the Depression. Because they had watermelon, the corn, you know, the squash, tomatoes, they grew. Plus they had cows, they had cows too. And, uh, and Captain Grandy, or Los Conejos was known, my understanding, as one of the best fiestas around. Mm. Because the people were very hospitable, they were very kind. They would kill a, a, a steer, and barbecue the whole thing, cut it all up, and share it with everybody. You know. Grandma, Grandma Hyde, she told me, she said when they, okay, when they were bringing the people from down that way over to Capitan, she said that they, um, her, must have been her grandmother. Or maybe her mother, could have been her mother, that she was two years old. She remembers walking from San Diego to Capitan. You know, she walked all the way, because the people did, they walked all the way from down there up here. Because they, they didn't want them down here. We were seen as being inferior. So because we were never respected, and often even thought as being not even human, um, because they felt that we didn't take baths often and we stunk. So we were kind of like subhuman, maybe. We, didn't take, we used to take baths in our ancient history. My grandmother told me, Chrysanthic Retack, she said her grandmother would go down every morning to Conejos Creek because they lived not too far from there. You know where our, our family Pico plot is there? Mm -hmm. Well, they would go down to, she would go down to cold or whatever to Conejos Creek and take a bath every morning. Uh, and everybody else, they were, everybody was clean. Um, and uh, so the, um, uh, so we, and they weren't, they were stinking and dirty because I, I grew up stinking and dirty and they called me a dirty stinking Navajo Indian. And I was pissed. I'm going to beat this kid up. Uh, not because I was dirty and stinking, because I was dirty and stinking. I never brushed my teeth. I never, well, I never took showers or anything. We didn't have much water, hot water, trust me. Um, and, um, but I was pissed because he called me Navajo. <laughs> Anyway, because they thought they saw us as inferior, and because they saw us as inferior, that they didn't even have to talk to us. They went to our great white father, which was in Washington D.C., because the city, the citizens of the city of San Diego, the people who were actually investing money, 
uh, in the city believed, and which was true, that if they had a water reservoir, they could pump water uh, through gravity flow uh, and uh, have more irrigation water for places like El Cajon, uh, La Mesa, Spring Valley, uh, and those people that had owned large tracts of land that could access that water and make more money by growing more, you know, more agriculture. Oh, coming from down in Captain Grande, they went through a lot of adversity. They had where they would take trips to get food, flour, rice, beans, into the town of Lakeside. That was a one-day trip from Captain Grande to and another day back. So that was basically two days that they spent getting this. They'd bring enough food back to share among the tribal members that were down there. While the other people would go off, they would go ahead and start, you know, going out and hunting, bringing in proteins that they could find. My, I remember my grandmother talking about how her and her sisters would go into the, uh, what they called Cedar Creek, which is now San Diego River, and they would use their dresses to catch fish, try to get the trout that was in the waters. And what they caught, they pretty much shared among one another. So it was a pretty interesting time at that time. Mom said that they went to the vendor when they go to the store, that that's the way they did. They take the buckboard, it would take them about a week to go down to the store and come back in Canelos. You know. It was an adventure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, they probably stopped here, stopped there, you know, and kind of made. Well, the Indians did that for a long time, you know. With, uh, it was just a, would would go would be going to uh, maybe um, Campo or someplace up that way, and would drive. Uh, they had a rest stop over there, right across from the rest stop is now. But there was a there was a uh, spring there, and uh, would always pull over, break out the bologna sandwiches and the uh, potato chips and the sodas, you know, and we'd sit there and we'd eat and then we'd be on our way again, you know. Realize the Captain Grande people, they were forced out of the land that they grabbed. The stories that I heard about when they were leaving in the 30s, the early 30s, I don't, I can't even fathom that happening today, where a truck would drive up and where our grave sites were down there, they dug them up, and as they found remains, were put into containers that resembled what I was, what were described to me as coffee can type of uh, devices. They'd put them on the back of a truck and they'd drive them to the reservation up here to be reburied. But she never spoke of anybody going. Does anybody here? Can anybody here identify these people? They didn't take that time. They were in such a hurry to get people out that they did. They just dug them up, split them up between Viejas and Barona, and let them and buried them. There's 60 unknown also up there. And how many here? 60. 60 here. Too, so There's 60 here that were originally brought up in 1933, and later on there were other unknowns found, and they were delivered here to the reservation and given a burial. But the original 60s, are, they're coveted by the small white crosses that sit in our cemetery. Being a part of the Piper family, they took it upon themselves to take care of those grave sites, those crosses. I did it from the time I was five years old, putting flowers on, painting the crosses. And as time grew up, I was taught how to make the crosses, replace the crosses, the proper way to do it. You know, the, there are, you just don't throw two pieces of wood together. You got to have a lot of feeling inside. You got to feel like you're doing this for them. And watching these old people, they were going like this, and like this, and like this, and then knowing what I, what I had found out later on about the Catholic Church and what it did, you know, and yet our people suffered under that. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't make me ousted or not wanted or not uh, uh, shy away from it, what it did was it, I felt like, I felt like the, the Indian people, the old Indian people, the ancestor people, that they suffered 
under that yoke of oppression, you know? Mm -hmm. They said, that's what I call the yoke of oppression. It's the mission. Look, they said there was a woman down there in uh, Canals, and uh, she did, she got, she raised tech with the priest, and the priest told her, he exiled her. Told her she was gonna live alone all of her life. And I guess she did. She went to the, the edge of where the reservation was in the back that way. And uh, she had her, house, her little house back there, or her little place where she lived. And she was always alone because nobody wanted to go visit her because the priest. The priest, yeah. The tribe was the one who dictated the way I understand things of what my purpose is was never see it wasn't a, it wasn't a, uh, 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 a settler colonial kind of viewpoint to where I said well I'm going to be an engineer and I'm going to go to school and I'm going to make a lot of money uh, and um, I think I'll move off the reservation and, and go live the, uh, at the beach you know uh, um, it, 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 uh, I don't know. I just I never thought that way. I always thought that, and then, and and in my peers, and even now today, hear the younger people talking to me that we want to go get an education so we can bring that back and so we can do to help our own people. You know, we knew we were we were different than than outside. We grew up with that. Grew up with the community. The community. When you grew up here, it was different than if you went to school out there, the American school, then you came back here to the community where you were safe, you know, where you could be different. You could be different out there. You had to be like them. But here, we could be ourselves. And uh, I think that's what they were. They were themselves here. We're, I rolled on the scene of a fire. Our captain at that time didn't tell us that the uh, truck was out of service. He didn't put it out of service. We rolled in there and had no pump engine on it. There was no way to pump water on a fire. Embarrassing. Was that here at Vegas? Here, yes. And, you know, there was another time where... Well, what would you guys do? You didn't pump water. Hey, well, there's nothing else to do. Just go back home. Oh. We couldn't do nothing. Fire's going up the hill. We ain't <laughs> catching that bad boy. <laughs> you know, and we, you know, and seeing what we're at now, oh, my God, it's amazing. I mean, I can remember we had a fire. We had a, our first structure rig on this reservation. And it had a hole in the tank. So, took it apart. Got some fiberglass stuff. We we did it to the max, and our station captain no, thought it would be a better idea to if he added some roofing tar in there because that was waterproof. Well, that worked out really well until you start the pump and the tar went through the hoses and clogged the nozzles. <laughs> Again, no water, huh? No water. But I've seen the department go from when. The fire truck would come down the road with no brakes, go right on through the tribal center and down to the down to the corral and have to turn around and come back up. Uh, I mean, they're watching the kid, little kids from the bunny school go collect all the equipment that fell off as it hit the bumps. So how they survived the genocidal period. Um, and it's that way now, today, here in Vegas. People are just kind, you know, they... You look around, they put their arms around each other, you know. You don't do that other places. But we're going to prevail. No doubt about that. I mean, we're already, the seventh generation is just healthy. It could not be any better than it is right now. But there's a lot of problems. Yeah, people are dying from fentanyl overdoses and in their own family. You know, I don't know about that one. I don't know how we're going to. I don't have any answers on that one. The long term is a spiritual um, awakening. 
of some kind, uh, because that's who we were, see, at one time. We couldn't help but be spiritual. That's all we ever did.